On today's Question of Faith, why do we not teach children to genuflect when they enter a church? Happy Easter, everyone. This is Question of Faith. I am Mike Hayes. I'm the Director of Young Adult Ministry in the Diocese of Cleveland. And I'm Father Damian Ferentz, the Vicar for Evangelization. And I'm Maria Wankata, Marriage and Family Ministry Specialist. Before we get to our question, how was your Easter? It's still Easter, by the way. Lovely, yeah. We're in the middle of the octave here. It was lovely. I was able to preside at a couple major liturgies, which I normally don't do because I'm in special ministry, you know, Mm -hmm. so just love that and had a lot of, yeah, very prayerful, good times. Cool. I was the MC for most of the liturgies at St. Brendan's, and then they asked me to do the blessing of the food, which was the first time for me doing that, mm. which, was, uh, which was really interesting and cool. Like, I, it, it was never part of my family tradition either. Mm. Um, you know, mostly, you would know this, like, mostly Eastern, Eastern European Europeans, yep. kind of folks um, have done this, but you know, St. Brendan's is still kind of an Irish parish, um, and so they, they've caught on to this, and so the... We yeah, about thirty people bring baskets in. Yeah, I teased them and said, "I said, Father, Father told me that I get to take something out of all of your baskets." At the <laughs> end. Actually, it's a it's a tradition to give something to the priest or the deacon after the blessing has taken place. So I used to collect. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. Yeah. Not so much for me. No one, oh, gave, no. No one gave me anything. Oh. <laughs> anyway, Maria? Very nice. Yeah, the whole trade one was very nice. Yeah, it was fun. Looked like pre-COVID days, as uh, we said before. It was. It was packed. It was good to see a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Um, you said your priest threw his arm out, uh, sprinkling people? Yes, yes. So the church was packed. We had overflow. And, um, yeah, he said he was not meant to be a pitcher. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you you got to warm up when you get in your 40s if you, before you mm-hmm. start throwing. I played catch with my nephew the other day and warm up a little bit first. But the same is true when you're doing the sprinkling right. Yeah, stretch. Yeah. Figure it out. At uh, one parish at St. Wendelin, they have like a, a broom brush. So yeah. That's nice because that it, it gets a lot more people wet. It's lighter mm-hmm. um, and probably safer because if that would drop out of my hand, well, someone's going to get like a hit by a brush. But at uh, St. Mary of the Falls, there's one of those brass aspergellums, mm-hmm. I think it's yes, called, with the correct. ball on the mm-hmm. end. Um, but I was I was throwing that thing hard, and I was thinking as I was doing that, if the ball came off, could probably cause some serious damage because I'd probably throw about a sixty-five mile an hour yeah. fastball still. You still know, so. Yeah, exactly. When when this is crazy, just to forewarn you. So I saw a priest one time. The aspergillum slipped out of his hand, and it went flying toward the back of the church. Mm. And some usher got under it, caught it with one hand. And the whole congregation, like, applauded, mm. right? And the usher got so excited, I'm. this really happened. I am not kidding. He threw it back. Oh, gosh. Mm. <laughs> and the priest, who cannot catch a cold, mm. somehow gets under it, catches it with one hand, sticks it back in the water, and went right back wow. on doing like nothing wow. had ever happened. Smooth. What no one knew was that they had a group of Baptists that were visiting that day. Hmm. And they sat in the back row, and they just wanted to observe. And then afterwards, the priest met with them, and they said, wow, that sprinkling right was something. And he <laughs> said, oh, yeah, we practiced that for months. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. Uh, the liturgical things that we end up doing. Yes. Uh, so speaking of uh, of church, the uh, question comes in and says, why does the clergy, clergy, this is what they pointed out here, uh, ignore teaching of reverence to children when entering the church. No longer does genuflecting, respecting, silence, and prayer before Mass practiced by both children and adults. Hmm. Um, well, it's a good question, mm-hmm. and I think there's a few answers to it. So let me let me take a stab at it this way. Go for it. And again, a lot of these things did change after the Second Vatican Council. Also so true. I would say that traditionally in Catholic schools, you had religious teaching, mostly nuns, and they would help young people know proper etiquette for Mass. Obviously, their their parents are supposed to be the first and best teachers of the kids in the ways of faith, but in Catholic schools in particular, the sisters did a really fine job um, showing them the proper manners and proper postures Mm -hmm. for liturgy. So when you went into a church, um, before the Second Vatican Council, the tabernacle was always up in the center of the sanctuary. So you would genuflect before you entered your pew. That's common practice. Uh Um, And in terms of silence, the the nun would probably teach that too. 
After the Second Vatican Council, for some time, um, a practice began where the Blessed Sacrament was put in a Blessed Sacrament chapel or a side altar, and therefore, when you entered the church, if the tabernacle was not in the center of the sanctuary, you wouldn't genuflect toward the center of the sanctuary because the tabernacle wasn't there. So perhaps um, it was in another room or on the side of the church. So if you were going to genuflect, you'd go that way. Mm -hmm. But you would at least bow toward the altar, which was a sign of reverence. And I think over time, maybe parents didn't realize this or weren't catechized or um, evangelized and then didn't know the practice, so didn't know what to teach it to their kids and just come to church and figure, I'll just get in my pew. So I'm guessing that's probably part of the history and the reason why some people don't genuflect when they come into the church. They were never taught properly, mm-hmm. um, or maybe there wasn't a tabernacle in in the center of the church. And we still have some in our diocese where the tabernacle isn't in the main body of the church, or at least is not in the sanctuary, in the center of the sanctuary. Right. That's my best I could do. Just point of clarification. So you genuflect to the Blessed Sacrament. Correct. You don't genuflect to the altar. You don't genuflect to a person, as we used to do in, you know, Roman times, if you would, or uh, merry old England, maybe. You know, you genuflect to the king or whatever, right? right? Um, Although Bishop Woos would say, after you've received... Holy Communion, you become a living tabernacle. Also true. So on some level, it would be appropriate to genuflect <laughs> to another person recognizing Christ in him or her. Good point. Yeah, but don't you don't have to you know you don't have to take that super literally. Yeah, I mean you could if you want, and then blame it on Bishop Boost. That's right. Yeah, it's his fault. Um, but you bet you genuflect, generally speaking, to the Blessed Sacrament as a as a sign of adoration. Correct. And if you can't, and for some some priests have bad knees and they're old, then you can bow. Um, because if you you can't genuflect, then you're not required to do something you can't do. Yeah, I was just going to say that. I was like, so my, my right knee does not work as well as, it, you know, on days. Mm-hmm. It's not every day, but some days it just does not work as well as I would like it to. And so I have a hard time genuflecting. Someone told me I, I, I started genuflecting on my left knee and someone, Father Trent told me, yeah, no, don't do that. And I said, why? He goes, yeah, he said, it's always the right knee. He said that apparently um, he couldn't remember exactly this, so, so I apologize to Father Trenta for throwing him under the bus here, but he couldn't remember exactly why he said that in olden times when you would genuflect like to the king, he said that you genuflected to a lesser lord with your left knee. Mm-hmm. And he said, so you'd basically be saying, well, but this is the, the, you know, the tabernacle is a lesser Lord if you're genuflecting to your left, with your left knee. So he said, so don't do that. He said, mm. just bow if you can't genuflect, do what's possible. Now, I heard that, let me, I'll I have to do this now, see how this okay. works. So when you genuflect Father's back in the day, now. you would go on your right knee because your sword would be on your left side Oh, here, very nice, yes. And you'd be able to pull it out. But who knows? I don't know. What, what, I mean... The you origins could, of this yeah, is spe- yeah. are, are specula- speculative at best. What do you think, Maria? Well, uh, when much. I thought, when Mike sent me this question, my immediate reaction was, I remember in grade school, so I was taught by Trinitarian nuns uh-huh. at St. Rocco, and I, I can go back to preparing for First Communion, walking in every week for Mass, and together as a class, genuflecting, to the tabernacle and then entering our pews and just how they instilled in us the proper body language and movements when Mm -hmm. you're in church and silence in church that you're entering God's house. And But then I did mention to Mike, but I'm sure my parents taught me before that. I mean, we've my whole life, always every Sunday we were at Mass, and I think the statistics show now that families aren't bringing their children to Mass every week, so the just like a sport, you have to practice things over and over again. And why you do what you do is um, if if our families are out of practice in doing this, then that's probably why we see the decline now because mm-hmm. it's not, you know, that that uh, memory, muscle memory of doing things in, in church aren't, they're not top of mind anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I I'm sure that I watched my parents. I don't remember them telling me to genuflect, but we went to church every Sunday, so... I probably saw them doing it, and they probably taught me it sometime, and that's how it goes, you know. I, re- I can remember my father would genuflect before he would go into the pew, and we sat on the, the tabernacle side, if you would. We had oh. a side altar in my home parish where the tabernacle was, and so my father would genuflect there, 
and say, that's what you do now, Mm -hmm. you know, and then uh, he would receive communion, and after he would receive communion, we would go past the tabernacle on our way back Mm. to my father would genuflect, Mm. like I can remember that. Um, And like you, I I had Franciscan nuns growing up, well, at least in seventh and eighth grade I did. I went to CCD, as they called it back in the day, uh, when I was a public school kid from kindergarten to sixth grade. The same nuns would teach us there. But they, they also taught us that. Um, they also taught us to kneel down when we'd enter a pew and say a prayer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty common too. But And again, some churches don't have kneelers, so you wouldn't right. think to do that if you were raised in a church that didn't have kneelers. But yeah. Well, we have them in our well on this floor, right? On mm-hmm. this floor, we have the Mater Ecclesiae Chapel, and there's kneelers in there. And I, that's what I do when I get in the pew. Usually I sit down or kneel down for a little bit before yeah. I sit. Yeah. yeah, I remember uh, with my kids, um, I've taught them that, yeah, genuflecting before the pew and you, you know, kneel down for a couple minutes, get ready for mass. And my daughter goes, what do you say? Mm-hmm. When you're, I'm like, oh. I'm just asking the Holy Spirit to come give me calmness and prepare my mind to, for the mass, to hear and yeah. receive God's word. So just something simple like that. One of the things I love about genuflecting and kneeling is that as Catholics, it does make us unique and I don't. I don't genuflect or kneel to anyone else. Maybe I'm kneeling if I'm working on my car or something. But other than that, um, it's a posture that's reserved solely for God. And I think it's an important one because it reminds – because we are bodies and souls, right, the human person, that what you do with your body matters because it speaks speaks something visible about what's happening invisibly within you. Yeah, yeah. And and the – Person who wrote the question also mentions, you know, silence. You know, when they mm-hmm. when they come in, that's a mixed bag. You know, you, you go into some churches and it's and it's very silent. You know, as people come in, they it's almost like they wouldn't dare talk. You know, before they, mm-hmm. you go in other places and it's like Grand Central Station. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of things going on, and I think you know I want to say two schools of thought, right? Like in some places, there's a lot of things going on in a parish. Like I was part of a big parish where there was always something going on all the time, and. The pastor that um, that I worked with in this particular parish, um, I thought he did something really ingenious. Was that there were there was always something going on before mass? Someone was registering people for a bake sale, or there was you know whatever it was. Right, there were all kinds of things going on, and so people were generally milling about. But then he would intentionally have a stop. You know, he would he'd have a cantor get up in front of the church and call us to worship. Yeah. And we would take intentional time for silence. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we'd even sing a Taze prayer to kind of center everybody. And then silence. Please stand for our opening hymn. Mm-hmm. You know, after about 30 seconds or so. It was lovely. You know, it was a nice way to kind of call people to that to, to that space. Yeah, at St. Joe's they're doing that. The music director, I think one or two minutes beforehand, he calls everyone to silence and calls everyone to to. Talk to yourselves in a little prayer right before Mass. Yeah. Yeah. At my first assignment down at St. Mary's in Hudson before the Life Teen Mass, well, first, a couple of things would happen. A lot of modern churches are built with gathering spaces. Right. So that would be the proper place to gather before or after Mass and to have community and chit-chat, donuts, coffee, and all that. And so there were two different spaces there. But even so, sometimes people got a little chatty in the church. However, before Mass started, I would go up, welcome people, welcome visitors, um, remind people to turn off their cell phones. If you're a gentleman, show it by not having a hat. Spit out your gum. Don't stick it under the pew. Here's your, <laughs> and then maybe we'd review some music if there were new hymns. Mm. And then we'd take um, a few minutes of silence as I went back and vested up. And in the meantime, in the bulletin, there were prayers to, uh, a few prayers that you could just pray to prepare yourself for Mass. So oh, that's nice. I think that's nice. So I do think a lot of it depends upon the architecture of your church because many of the old churches, you had a very tiny vestibule and then you were in. But the bigger churches, I'm thinking of like St. Basil, I'm thinking of St. Ambrose, St. Albert the Great. There are bigger spaces before you actually enter enter into the body of the church that are designed specifically for gathering. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And even even in churches that have those bigger spaces, the noise still kind of spills in, you know, yeah. the church sometimes. Unless you close the doors or something. Yeah. yeah, even that, though. It's not like they're soundproofed, you mm-hmm. know. I mean, it's, I think people still complain, oh, those people, you know, yeah. people want to try to clear the cobwebs out and they're kind of getting into that space yeah. before mass. They'll complain, say, ah, eh, there's all these people talking in the back. Yeah. 
Weddings are the worst. I, I, oh, I found yeah. that. You know, mm-hmm. like yeah. people were just talking. I remember my pastor, my, my pastor, Monsignor Troy was his name. Uh, there was this wedding that we were doing, and people had shown up early, and they're all talking at the top of their lungs in the middle of the church. We did not have a gathering space in, in our parish. And he walks into the sacristy, and he just goes, no respect. Mm-hmm. We're like Rodney Dangerfield. No respect. <laughs> yes, like that. Yeah. Well, there's so much joy. It's hard to keep it contained before. Yeah. Also well, true. Yeah, exactly. And I said, "Oh, come on! It's the nicest day of their. It's, yeah. it's supposed to be the happiest day of their life, right. rather. I guess it's not the happiest day of their life. It's the happiest day of the bride and groom's life." Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, okay." <laughs> uh, anyway, but yeah. So, um, why do you think this has sort of fallen out for some folks? I mean. P- poor catechesis, I'd say, yeah, or not not line. being reminded. I mean, I think on occasion, at least once a year, a pastor ought to write a column or give a homily about um, like proper etiquette at mass because we we tend to forget like how to receive communion properly. Mm. Um, I had a mass yesterday where someone found a host that was cracked after communion on Sunday, so I consumed it. But that's on the res- the responsibility of the Eucharistic minister. If someone doesn't Um, receive communion right away, you're to stop and make sure that they do or figure out what's going on and take that host back. If someone just walks away and cracks and leaves it in their, um, in their missile, it's a sacrilege, you know? So I think once in a while, you don't want to say this stuff all the time, but you want to say it enough that people know and get a good refresher and reminder. These are the things you do when you go into church. This is what Catholics do. And, and there's, you know, there's different ways to do different things and there's different churches, but um, yeah, reverence for the Eucharist is important, especially during this time of revival, I think. Yeah. And you want to say it joyfully, not um, yeah. <laughs> snottily. <laughs> right, right. Wagging a finger. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, hey, I want to help you prepare for Mass a little bit better. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. that's, that's one way you could say it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think with, um, so I'm involved with PSR and we've tried to move towards family catechesis. Mm. So we've gone through this year, like all the parts of the Mass and kind of reminding parents, even as they hand on the faith to their kids, like why why we do what we do. Why are there all these different parts in the Mass and what they mean? But on on top of that is empowering parents, like you said, Father Damien, that they're the first teachers and children are going to look up to what their parents do or not do and take after them. Like they're the biggest influence on their, their kids' lives. So you know, the family's church attendance, how they see their parents practicing their faith outside of the church walls and just regular faith conversation at home too. So it's not just, not just when we go to church, it's throughout their whole lives too. The the National Study on Youth and Religion, what did they say? As the parents practice, so does the child. Mm -hmm. And that tends to last for a lifetime for the most part. Sometimes there's some you know, variance in that as they get a little older. But generally speaking, if the parents practice a certain way, the child will retain those practices. And I think it's never too young. Like, yeah. at appropriate ages, like you bring a young child to Mass, maybe once, you know, they can sit on their own a little bit, like they don't have to have a snack throughout the whole Mass. Like, slowly draw their attention to different things throughout the Mass. And as they get older and they can read, like there's the Magnificat that they could take to Mass and follow along. Like, Different things like that they can introduce at appropriate age levels. My mother taught me how to read at Mass. Hmm. She she picked up the missalette and she'd point to the words and she'd have me follow along hmm. with it. And she said, do you, do you understand that? And I'd say, yeah, if there was a word I didn't know, I'd say, Mom, what does that mean? Yeah. You know, and she then she would tell me what it say, was. Prevenient grace means <laughs> that's right. Yeah, something like that. I'm trying to think of one. You know, pray brethren. Maybe what does brethren mean? You know, yeah. like some, you know things like that. But I thought that was an ingenious way to do that. You know, mm-hmm. it made me pay attention. Mm-hmm. Right, it made me pay attention. It helped my reading comprehension. I was reading at a tenth grade level in the fifth grade. Wow. I mean, you know, mom did a nice job. Um, and my sister is a teacher, so she she was helpful also. But um, it let me know something special was going on, mm-hmm. you know, and I should pay attention to this. Um, so it was good. You know, yeah, it gave me a love of liturgy. I think. Yeah. What about what about you guys? Did um... I remember playing with Hot Wheels cars in the pew <laughs> and then dropping them over the front the front banisters. My parents were Eucharistic ministers, and then Father Mark Fedor, God rest him, he died recently, would give me a scowl as I picked them up. So I don't remember reading a missal. I remember being bored in mass as a kid. I was hyperactive, so to sit somewhere for an hour was really difficult. Yeah, it's hard. 
But I also remember not going up for a blessing and just sitting in the pew for communion time. Same. And then I remember my brother coming back to the pew and once I said, what is, what, what does Jesus look like? And he, ha- he opened his mouth and just showed me the host on his tongue. I'm like, <laughs> I don't understand how that could be Jesus. But I was very curious because everyone else in the church obviously believed that it was. So I, uh, yeah, I, I was not a super devout kid. I never played church. I, I loved the Lord, but I, yeah, mass was hard for me as a kid. Yeah. Yeah. When I was, when I was four, the first time I re- can remember going to mass with my father and my sister, my mother was sick a lot of my life. And so she wasn't with us, but um, she was probably in the hospital at this time. And uh, my father and my sister went up. My sister said to me before Mass, she said, okay, look, at some point we're going to go up to communion. And she said, and you're just going to stay here until we come back. We're coming back. Don't get worried. Mm-hmm. We'll be right back. We're just going up there. And she'd point to the front of the altar and I'd say, okay, sure, that's fine, you know. And... They might have been out of the out of the pew and up four rows, and then I couldn't see them, and then all of a sudden, wah! <laughs> and the guy, the, the family in front of me turned around. They're trying to comfort me and say, "Oh, it's okay. They're just up at communion. It's fine. Don't worry about it." You know, what's your name? You know, <laughs> and, and I just wouldn't have it. And finally, I feel my sister like tugging me back toward the pew, and she's like, "We're right here." <laughs> <You know? laughs> I wonder if that practice started after, like, the kidnapping and all that. Oh, maybe, yeah. Afraid to leave your kid in the pew. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, I don't know when that started. I can't, I can't remember. I was, as a, when I was trained as a Eucharistic minister, they would say, you know, send them over to the priest if they want a blessing. And mm-hmm. I could remember that. But that's the, so that would have been, like, 1988 or so. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. Yeah, I was talking with Father Trenti yesterday. This could be a whole other show mm. that you really shouldn't give blessings in communion line. Mm. So that could be a whole other show. A whole other we, show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Next week. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, by the way, we did station churches. So why don't we do that as our church search? Uh, how'd that go for, for all of you on Holy Thursday? Did we visit seven? Did we all visit seven? Or I did. I walked them, too. Started, well, I had Mass at Wendelin. So my first one was St. Pat's, Emmerich. No, Pat's, Malachi, Emmerich. And then over to Tremont for John Cantius, Augustine, St. Andrew Kim, and then down Willie Hill back to Wendelin for the final church. So it was the only collection of churches that you could have done in three hours walking, and I did it. My favorite one was St. Andrew Kim. I'd never been there before. And the Korean community was singing a hymn to our Eucharistic Lord in Korean when we arrived. Wow. And it was beautiful. I got a little misty-eyed there. Mm. And I went with probably about a group of 20 other young adults yeah. that just were at Mass, so it was cool. Yeah, I ended up doing eight, um, not because I wanted to. There was one that didn't have a reposition altar. I'll, mm. I'll leave them nameless at this point. Um, and so I felt like I needed to go to one more. Mm. But uh, I ended up going to – so I started out at St. Brendan's where I've been assigned for this year. So I did there. And then I came back into Lakewood. I went to Transfiguration, St. Clement. Then I went over to St. Luke's. Then I went to um, – I had to go over to St. Wendell and so I did the cl- I did a mm-hmm. reflection on the steps for the for the catching fire folks at St. Wendell which was lovely um, to see all of them and then went in with them for a little while and then I said hmm I need to get to two more and so I asked John Varis who helped organize mm-hmm. that I said what was the last church you went to because I figured that was the quickest one I could mm-hmm. drive to and he goes oh St. Malachi's and I was like mm-hmm. oh yeah okay mm-hmm. so I went over to St. Malachi's and I said hmm, it's 11 o'clock now. Do I have time to go over to St. Emmerich's? Will he still be open? And I drove over, and I opened the door, and Father Bono was right there with three people on, and he said, well, it's 5 after 11. This one doesn't count. Mm. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and I laughed. I said, I'm going to go pray over there, okay? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, go ahead. And then we talked for a little while, which was nice. And he helped really sort of bring this back. You know, he was the one who, who said that he had done this in Rome. And so he asked, he encouraged us to do it last year. And then uh, we've kind of kept it up. So it's mm-hmm. been great. Yeah. Um, I did a couple. So I started at Rocco's, which is where I attended a, a mass. And then – but – there was a steady stream of people in and out for like the hour I was there. Lots of families, big families. And then I went over to St. Pat's and there was a huge West young Park adult on group bridge. on bridge yeah. mm. coming out. I swear there were like 50 young adults coming out It's probably out catching around. fire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think they went there, yeah. But yeah, it was great. It looked like it was a very, very nice tradition to bring back. Now, I didn't get to St. Rocco's, but I know that they use that side chapel, which mm-hmm. is beautiful. Mm. I love that. Little yeah. chapel. But, and then on Friday, did the 
the walk from St. Michael on Scranton to St. Coleman to La Sagrada Familia. So that was another three-miler. It was a lot of walking. That's why I'm tired today, probably. Uh, <laughs> I did a – in St. Brendan's, I do a walk around the neighborhood there, which was about an hour for the stations of the cross. Mm. So I did that. So it was not a long walk, but it was still a walk. That's um, cool. And it was a little chilly, too. So yeah, it was – um, yeah. My my wife was you know, my wife gets cold when it goes from like ninety two to eighty eight. So <laughs> um, she was she was sort of shivering in the colds, and uh, she said, "You didn't tell me we're going outside." And I said, uh, "I think I did." And she goes, "No, nah, I don't think you did." <laughs> I was like, oh, "Well, sorry." <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was lovely. Uh, Ed Deveni helped uh, plan that, so it was a uh, good job out of him, our RCIA director at St. Brendan's. And so our readings for the second Sunday of Easter, the Divine Mercy Sunday. Um, the Acts of the Apostles is our first reading, which was the fir- was the reading that I read at my first communion, mm-hmm. actually. So just a quick little piece. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their property and possessions and divide them among all according to each one's need. Yeah, I always I always point to that and say, see how they loved each other, which is you know what Tertullian said is the thing that really converted people mm-hmm. from the early church. I read the Gospels. <laughs> I yeah, good. So I we see in the Gospel the uh, institution of the sacrament of reconciliation. Mm, right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, I mean, it's Divine Mercy Sunday, not Divine Justice Sunday, because mercy is actually higher than justice. Although yeah. it needs justice, it builds on justice. But if Jesus was only just. He could have told Peter, all right, Peter, you, like, I wanted you to do this. You kind of blew it. So I'm going to let you go back to your fishing. I'm going to put John in charge. But he didn't. He healed him with his forgiveness, showed him mercy. And then that was all Peter needed. And he went off. And the Acts of the Apostles are just that. We read the actions of the apostles after having encountered the risen Lord. And we see that they are now other Christs in the world, which is what we're supposed to be, too. We're one holy Catholic apostolic church. Very nice. So Divine Mercy Sunday this Sunday. We hope that you have enjoyed the early part of our Easter octave, and we'll see you all again next time here on Question of Faith. Ciao.